Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the What's Their Why podcast. As you can see, I'm here today with Nick Ponsford. Nick is a, well, this is going to take a while. So let me. Oh, no. I've had to shorten this down a little bit. So apologies if I've left really, like, something really vital out. But Nick is previously an award winning advanced skills teacher uh, and recognized EdTech thought leader and frequent keynote speaker. She was headhunted by the DFE for central roles during the pandemic uh, and currently works with a range of organisations, including people like Microlink and EdTech UK, and is also studying for a doctorate, doctorate in education. She's the founder of the multi-award winning Global Equality Collective, which always reminds me of like the Urban Cookie Collective. <laughs> so you uh, so got the key and the secret. That would be fantastic. Um, she's recognised as one of the top 50 women in tech um, through the Inspiring 50 Europe 2022 award, uh, gained a rising star award for education and academia, and has just been shortlisted as a BET 2023 Innovator of the Year, and believes that technology is the equaliser for our time. Welcome, Nick. Oh, yeah, I'm going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quit while you're ahead. Too I'm right. done. <laughs> hey. Listen, it's great to have you on, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a, a great chat. Um, we first met, I think it must be about four months ago now, through the, the Text Help um, Festival of Inclusive Education, uh, and we had a great chat there as part of the channel, so I was really keen to to get you on and to kind of to delve deeper into to your thoughts and your experiences as well, uh, particularly around the, not the Urban Cookie Collective, the Global Equality Collective. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about, about your background, first of all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre-teaching or teaching? Either. It's entirely pre-teaching is good as well. Like going yeah, back to yeah. school days, if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, you can probably hear the council estate accent. Um, so, uh, when I was little, school was kind of my safe place. Um, I was really into kind of like reading and drawing and things like that. Um, and you know, I was a girl who ended up you know, going to the grammar and having to take my tie off on the way home so I didn't get beaten up. I was one of those kids. And um, not only school was sort of a safe place, I kind of, I, I just loved it. I loved being at school. And I always kind of dreamed of being a teacher when I was an old lady. That was my plan. When when I was old and decrepit and I'd had a life, I would go into teaching. Um, and basically, I, I did a little bit of a stint in sort of marketing and advertising and things. And then um, I had quite a big car crash and then decided actually I did want to be a teacher. So I went into teaching like full force, like this is what I want to do. And um, I, I think it kind of all my strengths kind of together being a teacher. Uh, my friends used to call me Monica. I like being quite organised. And um, I think I really saw education as like like a world of opportunities like it given me opportunities when I was little and I kind of came into it thinking that's that's what you do as a teacher you give people opportunities and I think I realized I was sort of something a bit different I would kind of be led by the kids um I was I, I, I qualified as an English teacher and decided to sort of say to the head of department on interview do you do digital media? Because I'd had this lovely, great, but I don't remember the big old IMAX with the colour pops at the back. I'd had one of those. And I was like, oh, you know, you know, maybe we could have a bit of tech. And basically they gave me the job as an NQT. So as an NQT plus one, I had 110 A-level students lined up to do this course. I'd painted rooms blue. I'd had a ball. And the kids would sort of say, you know, we're doing film this. Can we go to Hollywood? And I'd go, yeah. And then go to the staff room and go, how do you do a school trip to America? And they'd go, oh, Nick, what are you doing? So um, I was that teacher and I kind of won. Uh, I was uh, nominated by uh, staff and students, won a teaching award, became an advanced skills teacher in new technologies. And and that was when I and that was back in about 2005, which is like, oh God, it's nearly like 20 years ago. How old am I? Oh, and uh, yeah, no, man. And this was, you know, this was just before iPods, iPhones coming in as well. And because I was I was doing a lot with sort of Apple products. I was just there, right time, right place, basically. Yeah. But I'd always treated, I think, the curriculum and technology as a bit of a sandpit. Just, you know, I'd just be, I'd try and be one step ahead if I could. You know, I'd be reading stuff. I became an examiner um, when it came to GC GCSEs and A-level media and then film. And then I uh, became an examiner and then I did um, a BTEC, which I kind of set up from scratch. And so 
I kind of I've always been quite honest that uh, I don't really know what I'm doing <laughs> I think people quite like it and then I just give it a go and just say yes and and I think all of those elements have made me kind of question what this education system is doing and look for ways that we can improve it and take some risks and do it a bit better I suppose yeah I, I, I love that analogy that you know calling it a sandpit I think it's really, I, I was uh, having a conversation um, yesterday with some representatives from the DFE and we were talking about you know how you make um, the the aspect of learning about technology for teachers more accessible and we were yeah. talking about sort of playgrounds and all that kind of idea and and you know I, like yourself I'm the kind of guy who'll just press something and ah, if I break it so what like I always undo or reboot or turn it off and turn it back on again so yeah. th there's not although I think a lot of people think that there's there's high stakes involved with technology you know I think that harks back to the days where you know the computer was a room the size of the staff room yeah. and if you touched it like heaven help you because the network yeah. manager would be after you um and in this day and age actually there there really aren't outside of the digital security and the digital safety mm -hmm. and you know your, your responsible usage and everything else there really aren't the risks that there used to be and it, and it can be like you say just to get in and, and play, get dirty with it, find out what it can do. And, and I think the more of us that talk like that about technology, mm -hmm. uh, the better, because I think it can come across that, you know, we are the kind of people who just spend all of our time finding out about things and we know everything and we're really confident with it. When yeah. in actual fact, no, we just see a button and click it, you know. No, and I think that confidence is really important. So as teachers, you know, the majority are very conscientious we like to get things right education is you know we've had a hundred years of formalized education and it feels like that there's you know there's hierarchies in schools there's budgets there's um you know kind of like the london rules um watching a bit of slow horses at the moment you know and, and i'm reading it and you know there's that kind of like we've got to watch our backs a bit and 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 all of those things don't really allow for like um you know, being a bit wild, being a bit reckless and taking risks. And so, I mean, one of the things I was, I was headhunted to work in one of the first labour academies in 2005, which is where I became the AST. Mm. And we recruited a lot of, you know, really, you know, you know, the staff really enthusiastic, those middle leaders, you know, new heads of departments, those kinds of people. And my job was trying to work out how we created a paperless school back in 2005. And, and, it was those confidence levels because I could I had to kind of put my finger on on how was I achieving what I was doing and I, I was just young and cocky and you know let's just give it a go and it kind of worked so I remember doing a thing um we call them daredevils and I would literally give a brown envelope a brown unmarked envelope to these these leaders and it would be a mission so we'd have mission possibles and they'd have to go away and they could either tell their students or or not and they were essentially like little bits of action research. So, it, you know, back in the day, it was like, you know, like no hands up or using a particular type of tech or just like different way, you know, taking all the chairs away for a day or putting chairs in if it was like a drama or more of a physical space. And we kind of created this little buzz that, the, you know, the kids would be kind of looking out to see what the teachers were going to do next. So that was exciting because it was a school where we really need to engage the students. Lowest key stage two results in the country. But for the staff, they had kind of a buffer because it was kind of like, well, Nick made us do it. And they would come back and then we would have sessions where it would be, did it work? Did it not work? How would we do it better? Would it work better with a different year group? Would it work better if actually you did it rather than I did it? Is it a personality thing? And we started to kind of work out, I think, the strengths and weaknesses of trying different things. And there were things like, um, I don't know if you remember, like uh, power teaching, mm -hmm. uh, learning to just kind of come in. So the power teaching is just, I love it. I love it. And it's, I think now it's almost been, it's called like whole brain teaching and all this kind of things where kids repeat stuff back to each other. And, you know, there's different things you can do to keep them engaged. And, and actually looking back that even, I think if people were doing that now, that would seem quite wild and, and kind of like, but it gave people because they got to take all these risks, some would work and some wouldn't. So they would be more resilient as teachers. And I think it's kind of a problem that we've got when it comes to things like diversity and inclusion and technology. We don't want to take the risk because what if it goes wrong? What if we have to be accountable? What, 
you know, it takes us out of our comfort zone. And do you know what? We're time poor anyway as teachers. We don't have a time. We don't have the resources. And and so I think that's that's something that only school leaders can put in place in schools. It's very hard if you're the one teacher doing it. I had fantastic heads of, of school. I was a head of school, you know, CEOs, all those kinds of people. But they have to be willing to make that jump with you. So I do understand why teachers find it difficult to be that person doing it. Um, and I think the other thing that leads on to it is we're not always very good at celebrating other people's success in teaching as well. Um, I know that, you know, when I got a teaching award, I was really excited. And actually, I, I wasn't ready for some of the kind of toxic behaviour of, of colleagues. And and I think for teachers who do want to stand out or, you know, they're doing something that's different, there can be a bit of a backlash in schools as well. So, again, I think that's why senior leaders really, you know, have to create those ecosystems where staff can kind of have a play. I don't know what you think. No, I, I completely agree. I think like you say that that whole issue around like that kind of toxic behavior around sort of recognition i wonder how much of that is because you know as teachers invariably we spend so much of our time in our own classroom not seeing what's going on yeah. elsewhere that actually we we don't have any kind of concept of what other people are doing and yeah. therefore we don't really give it any credibility we just assume oh it must be a popularity contest or or something along those lines without yeah. taking a step back and saying well why are that why is that person's lesson so popular that they're yeah. getting nominations for these things and and other people aren't you know yeah you know it's not it's not always going to be exactly the the same and it's not always going to be the reason behind it but mm -hmm. but i think there is that element that you know we just have so like you say we're so time poor mm. uh, and there are so many ways that we we can gain the time back if mm. we think about it um, creatively mm. and really start to kind of audit where our time is being used. But but that in itself takes time. And like you say, when you're under pressure mm. and you've got results pending and you're only as good as your last set of results to a certain extent, you know, it's like being mm. a, a Premier League football manager in a way. And, you know, you can yeah. win the Champions League one season and then the following year, if you're down in fifth, they're looking to get rid of you, you know. Um, I, I'm a West Ham fan, so I'd love to be in fifth. Um, <laughs> no, I don't understand anything about football anymore. I've completely kind of pulled out of it. But I, I, I think there's also a bit that, you know, trying to give things a go can kind of be scary. Mm. And there's always, always it comes back to kind of time. Now, mm. there's a there needs to be a little bit of an advertising change, I think, with teaching, because I don't know any teacher that gets to the end of a day and goes, right, that's it. I'm all done you know well done you know there I am like teaching is a job that doesn't end it, it doesn't end and so we have to manage our time we have to have boundaries and say no and again be confident in that have you know with our line managers we need to be aware of our rights uh you know and 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 say and speak out and and, and strike if necessary to say you know what what helps and us do our jobs in the most productive ways and I think kind of an understanding that actually I don't have as much time as uh, as I want to. And, and this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. What things do I need to do to make it work better for my class, better for my year groups, better for my school and better for myself? Um, and that's where being able to engage with communities where either online or offline or within your school or external and can really help. So, I mean, I when I was doing a lot of my technology training I suppose where I was just teaching myself and making mistakes and then trying to remember what it was so I could teach it the next day I had online communities and I think that's why I've always liked those online communities because I might be the one teacher in a school doing this thing or one teacher in a year group or the other teachers on the other side and I never get over to that side because the lessons are all at rubbish times um or I'm with students at lunchtime or break you know all that kind of thing so I would engage with online communities and and those spaces you know, very much like yourself with actually I'm going out. I've got a, like a, a polite techie, ed techie thing that I need to sort out. I'm going to go to the people that will help me. I'm going to go and see what they're doing. And I think there are ways is that you can get that help and become more confident. And it doesn't always rely on your school um, mm. that that the online communities. I mean, for me, that's why I've wanted to kind of give so much back to it really helped, you know, me and my stripes as I kind of went through it. Absolutely. You know, and I can't recommend getting involved highly I, I know there's there's often in schools a kind of 
reluctance to get involved in things like Twitter and all that kind of thing because of negative press around it. But if you, if you, you know, you follow the right people and you get involved in the right conversations, absolutely. It's, it's such a rich resource. And uh, oh, yeah, I've know. made a career out of it, basically, out of Twitter. I mean, I started on Twitter in 2010 and on LinkedIn as well. That's when sort of social media hit education. And you know, through LinkedIn, through it again saying yes to things, I met Dr. Julie M. Wood and ended up co-writing Techno Teachers, which which Harvard published, um, which blows my mind because I wrote it when my oldest was napping. And I've never met Julie in real life, but I gave it a go. And then Twitter has helped, you know, me form the GC basically and all the work we've done there. And I mean, I don't I don't come across much negativity on Twitter. I, I think I must be in this like sunny place. Um but, you know, I, I, I'm on Twitter every day. I've made incredible relationships and friendships um, mm. as well as sort of colleagues and customers and clients. And, you know, I think there is you have to again, I suppose it's that confidence of understanding where technology can be used for good and how it can suit you. And I think if if you are in a school where it is a bit toxic or you're you don't feel that you're getting what you need, I think there's particularly within the ed tech and the digital communities in education there's so many out communities out there that can wave the pom-poms in your face when you need them yeah absolutely actually I, I saw somebody saying the, um, this morning I was on Twitter and they were talking about wouldn't it be great if there was a service you could go to and someone could just give you a pep talk yeah like, no context like no need to know your background but actually just people who are trained to just say I need a pep talk in a minute can you just pick me up and you go yeah, yeah give me five minutes and I'll sort you out what a, you know, what a great service to be able to offer. <laughs> well, I try and do that on my Twitter feed. So if anyone wants to come over and join me, I'm, I'm, I'm normally trying to bring a bit of sunshine into people's lives, particularly when it's horrible and grey like it is today. Yeah, but at least it's warmed up slightly. We've, we've had like five days of permafrost, so we've finally got a bit of a thaw going on here. So you, you mentioned the, the GEC there. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that came about and what it's about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... Um, Basically, as well as work on technology, um, inclusion has really been, I suppose, sort of a side ha hustle, which has now become a bit more of, of actually like the day to day. So I think I realised as well as kind of experiment and playing around with with a bit of tech, I also started to, you know, the, the subjects that I were, was putting on was attracting students that normally hadn't engaged. And so part of my remit was trying to engage the students that sort of generationally hadn't had kind of you know jobs um let alone careers or even finished qualifications but also starting to question why was that so why are we in a state sector just as like the nhs you know treats people that turn up why are we not treating all our students you know in the same way why in a state sector are actually our most vulnerable and marginalized children still coming out worse like surely it should be kind of the other way around i, I didn't really understand it um and so a lot of my work in schools you know I was head of school um so I also took on like a really big um pastoral role with it I worked um as I said um in one of the first labor academy schools where we had you know horrific things three thirty on a Friday normally um like horrendous I, I, I don't know if I should detail what they are but horrendous the most the things you could kind of get and I started to become really curious why as the adults as the staff we were allowing this to kind of happen like we're the grown-ups like I don't do it understand it when I became an AST I then was very lucky that my achievements allowed me to kind of choose where I wanted to work and um, due to my then husband's job we moved to Surrey and I took on a job where um, Millie Dowler had been I don't know if you remember oh, her yeah. she was a student who was murdered on her way home and I went in and I was even part of that year nine team working where she'd been in year nine at the time and and then I became really interested in kind of workplace culture not just that you know, that feeling on a Sunday night about going in the next day, uh, which is a real test of a school culture. But also, you know, what if what if there's been something that kind of rips that school apart? Like how how do we mend that and how do we help people continue to be productive and, and create also like a community for students and, and families as well? So, you know, I learned a lot and kind of on the back of this at the time, inclusion kind of meant send and disabilities. Um so um 
when I had my first child and he had needs as well and I, I, I was told I couldn't be a senior leader if I couldn't work five days a week thanks very much um I came out of it and I worked for an educational charity called Achievement for All and Achievement for All were really focused on uh closing the gap for the least attaining bunny ears um students and I did that four years working across schools in the south um like early years to post 16 and STEM schools and then after I had my twins I did I wrote all the online training for not just the practitioners but also for the coaches and all of that then started to generate about actually it's about the attitudes and values the same things I'd kind of realized right in techno teaching we need to get the dispositions and the mindset right around technology actually we need to do the same thing when it comes to diversity and inclusion um and so kind of on the back of that at the time around 2017 uh, the focus seemed to be mainly on gender uh, the gender pay gap had been brought in so um, big corporations were kind of reporting on it and 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 what happens in education is then there's a kind of like a slow ripple into the education sector of what everyone else is kind of doing um and at that time graham andre who is on twitter who's awesome and it, um he's behind primary rocks as well he had just been on uh, the BBC Two BAFTA nominated No More Boys and Girls, which if you haven't seen it, do follow Graham as a teacher, primary school teacher on the Isle of Wight. And it, the short version is it kind of looked at the, the things he might do that might impact on gender equality for the girls and the boys in his classroom. He created a Twitter group and uh, the result of that was he invited people he knew were in the DNI space to be part of it. And, and, and I got invited in, which was amazing. And um, I felt like a very, you know, a little fish. I hadn't really done diversity and inclusion as a whole. I was kind of more focused on on the kind of socioeconomic status and disability and I suppose the intersectionality kind of around all that. And then what I realised in that chat was all these sort of heroes of d and well, it was all like, you know, it's, it's those conversations around education we get a lot like, oh, these are the facts and these statistics and it's all awful and it's going to take 100 years for gender equality and uh, when are the DfE going to do it? And, and like boring, <laughs> really boring and just like, well, we can't do anything about it. So, huh, you know, and I was like, you know, we've had the same problems with boys and literacy since the 1960s. We've got major issues with even just women going into technology, let alone taking an intersectional lens kind of through it. I was like, like, is this not enough? And and I'm sorry, but I didn't have faith in the government that they were going to sweep the board when it comes to DNI. Yeah. So I was a bit of, well, you know, how what's going to happen? And in the chats where I met Kat, and so Kat Wildman and I, we originally kind of got our heads together because she was looking for a solution for gender equality in corporations. And she happened to be product director of a Telegraph at the time. And so I talked to her about the way that school improvement worked for the work I've done with Achievement for All for nine years. And basically together we worked on a technological kind of route. And so she is um, now founder of Power by Diversity and she works with kind of corporations. And my side is a Global Quality Collective, which works in education. And basically what I've done is exactly what I used to do when I was trying, when I was learning something new. And I've done it the same way with DNI. So um, the people first. So I've gone out and I've tried to find who is doing DNI well. You know, what what is DNI first? And I think the work of a Global Equality Collective. It, it's very much like any kind of improvement that we do in education. So um, we've got an incredible collective of subject matter experts. Um, so across not just the Equality Act, because that's the other thing. I didn't think the Equality Act went as far enough. So I've brought in things like social economic status, because you can't work in the state school sector without acknowledging it. Things like single parent rights, neurodiversity, flexible working, menopause, as well as the nine characteristics of Equality Act. And also I did a kind of deep dive into you know, what was happening with marginalised groups and what was happening with CPD in schools. So mm. as is the case now, we get like one speaker from a marginalised group and they come in and they do a talk and it can either be really expensive for the school. Um, it could be, sometimes it has a negative effect, not actually the outcomes the school kind of wanted because yeah. it's very hard to get someone who's got lived experience and like a coaching in an educational role. I mean, that's hard to get all those together. So anyway, so we've gone out, we've got grassroots groups, I've got amazing coaches, speakers. Um, and so we put on 
lots of things to help schools, but we do it in a really accessible way. Um, and then the other side of it is the technology. So what I realise is the, the kind of a teacher training days, they don't really work. You know, when you know you've got one, you're like, how can I sneak some marketing? Well, I used to. How can you sneak some marketing in? Or yeah. there'll be, you know, someone there with their arms crossed. Uh, everyone kind of feels that they want to get on and do something better. And there's also this kind of initiative idea that in six months, no one's going to be doing it anyway. And I just thought that's a bit of a waste of time. And why weren't we doing something a bit more exciting? And because of the work I had done building online courses, I've created courses for future learning stuff. I was like, there's got to be a kind, and this is pre-COVID, a kind of online way that we can actually educate educators and stuff that really matters, but done in a really accessible way that's around them. But also, it's cheap, but it's high quality and it's centralised. So that's what the technology around the, the GC is. So basically, um, I went with uh, like a PowerPoint, uh, Kat and I, to an angel investor in February 2020. They liked our idea of this platform, um, which I'll tell you about in a sec. Um, we got the first round of investment within, I think it's about between 48 and 72 hours. I was contacted and asked to help with the EdTech Demonstrator program because we just went into lockdown. Um, so we started to build the GEC platform. And then basically, George Floyd was murdered in the summer, Sarah Everard in the autumn. And I realised that rather than just doing looking at disadvantage, which was my focus, actually, the world was kind of ready to go for these global quality collective characteristics. So we wrote the whole thing at the same time we were launching it in January 2021, which is a big thing. We'd worked with three universities, we'd pilot tested it, we'd done it all, but we were like, let's go back. And then um, basically launched the the platform, which is the world's first DNI solution, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm now at a point where the GC platform has been out there for about a year. And I was really crossing my fingers we'd get, if we got about 100 schools, I'd be, you know, chuffed a bit. Anyway, we smashed it. We've got, you know, uh, well, I think we've got about coming up to about 250 schools in the first year. 10% of them are internationals. We've now got independent schools using it. Um, and at the moment, I'm now working with universities and some of our schools to look at how we bring in student surveys, because the first bit was getting the staff right, both staff attitudes and values right. Um, and that's that's what the kind of the BET award, I think, is for, because, I, you know, looking at intersectionality in education is really hard. I've also started doing a doctorate um, and looking at it. And, you know, it is hard. You can't look at this kind of thing without the technology. Um, so the GEC is a kind of collective of subject matter experts. We've got about 15,000 in our online communities. Twitter's our biggest one. We've got about 8,000 on that. Um, and then we've got our GEC platform as well. So that's the GEC. And, and you know, if, if people haven't had a look already, definitely do take a look because, um, you know, it, it's one of those things that that is just providing exactly what's needed. Um, and as you say, in an affordable way mm. um, and one of the the battles that that is, is obviously happening at the moment because of the you know the global crisis and the cost of living and everything else is that budgets are being cut left right and center so that we can afford to keep the heating on for the students or yeah. you know keep the lights on and 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 quite often it's it's like these kind of tools and, and really vital things that can sometimes fall by the wayside because mm. If you just look at the numbers, you can kind of say, well, you know, can we really justify that if I'm asking teachers to to not have this or, or, or vice versa? And actually, it's not just about looking at the financial costs. And I think it's really important. And we're doing a lot of work in, in our trusts at the mm -hmm. moment to look at, you know, the metrics around it. Yes, the financial cost is one aspect, but but also what what's the potential? What's the usage like? You know, are you paying for three different things that are doing very similar things when you could just be paying for one yeah. and be much more consistent and impactful with it? You know, um, and, and, and I think it's really important that that schools do get to grips with that and, and give themselves a kind of a, um, a, an audit, if you like, um, and clear the decks a little bit, particularly post COVID. You know, there was there was mm. such a, a, a clamoring, understandably, for ways to engage students that that weren't sat right in front of you mm. and people found and began using so many different approaches and some work for some 
and some didn't and some worked for some subjects but didn't work for others and you know we're, we're not in the luxury anymore of teachers teaching one subject you know many are teaching three or four or, or sometimes yeah. five so different approaches for different things not different pay that's completely we don't even get me started on that yeah yeah, yeah. Where does that go when you when you teach five different subjects? How how do the department decide how much they're going to pay you? You know, ridiculous yep. ideas that that are floating around. You know, um, but you know the idea of just being able to go to like you say a collective, uh, uh, for want of a better word, a hub of mm. who are just prepared to give, I think is is fantastic and uh, and and all credit to you. I mean, it must have been a real labour of love. It is, it is, you know, every day I kind of be doing it. Um, I've looked, I think the Twitter I started right at the beginning of the, and that was five years ago. And I, you know, I've done bits of contract work in between, like, yeah, ed tech, DFE ed tech demonstrator, and then more recently, um, the assistive technology program we've got coming up for the DFE. I've taken on bits of, you know, sort of lecturing work and that kind of thing. But all of it, it all comes back to the work with the platform and, and you know and what you're saying I understand you know I was that teacher I I started off doing English I then started doing media and then film and then I'd have to pick up a bit of ICT and you know I've taught four subjects and and I also you know I I do understand what we're, we're going through a crisis at the moment but out of crisis becomes change and kind of disruption and new solutions and and what's really key, I think, at the moment is the kind of recruitment and retention of staff. You know, we know that things like lockdown and flexible working have had a massive impact on, um, you know, teaching assistants in particular. I mean, why would you want to work at a school when you can work at a supermarket and get discounts and do better hours and be acknowledged and spoken to in a better way than you would if you were in a school? Mm -hmm. So there's bits that I think instead of kind of looking back of what we've done before, we need to start looking forward about what we're going to do for the next 50 years, the next 100 years in education. And so the GEC platform, the way it works is it asks an organisation from a leadership point of view, what are they doing about things like inclusion and belonging and staff provisions and marketing and recruitment, as well as curriculum and students and families. Um, and then there's one for all staff. So the thing that I felt as a teacher and doing the work that I've done as, a, as a, a coach nationally and internationally is you never hear the voice from the people that you really want to. Like you never get the parent of a parent's evening. It's that kind of thing that you want to speak to. And so, you know, things like technology, like people will Google questions that they won't ask their friends and family. So, you know, we work with clinical psychologists at the University of Surrey and Kent in UCL and worked out a way to make a uh, a really psychologically safe place where people can be really authentic about their lived experience at a school, how they might feel marginalised, how they feel, you know, that they've been really included, you know, the highs and the lows, and do it in a way that, that you know, we've worked with UX designers. And this isn't just like a Google thought. We've worked really hard that because we want people to say how they feel because we want we want schools and trust to retain your best staff you know throughout their life as life changes you know as as your staff go on and have kids or don't have kids or you know they're trying to meet the the new demands that other dependents have on them or partners losing jobs you know all that kind of stuff and so what i wanted to do was provide an easy way for schools to kind of get all of that information but in a way that really respected the staff and their voices. So it includes that. And then we've got inbuilt coaching. So the thing that really annoyed me about a lot of the spaces, you know, consultancy organisations, you know, charging schools ridiculous amount of money at a time they can't. So a wonderful collective who, you know, I say they don't have the sharp elbows. They want to make everyone else the experts. They don't want to do DNI at people. So we've got inbuilt coaching as part of our all, you know, whole school and, and DNI led. And then just for fun, we've got a Netflix style training hub for all starts. So site team, administrators, parent, governors, you name it, all included in it. And high quality looks good by the best out there because that's what schools should get. That's what we should have been getting. And what's what we should have had for years. And we haven't. And, you know, the fact that, 
you know, crowdfund and raised over £300,000 to build this is testament not only to the fact that other people kind of believe this needs to be out there. And 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 in education, we should have high quality tech that, that looks good and, and feels good. But also, you know, there's that need that technology can step in and do that we haven't done well in education, that we need that technology to help us with that that kind of next step. And I think there's been a lot of that around teacher workload. There's a lot about marking. But actually, that's not the reason that necessarily people always leave a job in education they leave because they feel they're not acknowledged they feel that they're not kind of seen they don't know what the career points are um it doesn't suit their new lifestyle so my hope is that this will really bring that kind of you know that well-being and and those that respect that we need you know it, we're not just monkeys who do marking and i think that you know seeing how things like AI is now coming into that. I mean, we're starting to see how that future of working, that automation is going to change in education. That's, this is, you know, tech is integrated, is part of our lives and it is part of education today. Absolutely. I mean, Google have um, re released this morning the second part of their future of education report. Uh, mm. And in there, there's, a, there's a, a section on AI and just looking at, the time-saving elements for teachers. Mm. Some of the stats are fantastic when you when you look at it, and you know the research that's gone into it. That you know number of hours of week saved in terms of preparation time up to eleven hours. Yeah, yeah. And I was, you know, I was an English teacher, so yeah. I, you know, I know I the heavy kind of marking, and then I used to do the coursework stuff. And you know, if ten years ago you'd said we wouldn't be marking everything in, in students' books anymore, which is where we're at already. You know, we don't mark books in the same way we did 10 years ago. You think in another 10, it's 20 years. Yeah. Well, exactly. And, and, you know, and, you know, we we didn't foresee this kind of move to online learning. We, there's universities. You look at what Dyson's doing. Mm. Universities aren't working in the same way. Um, I mean, particularly after lockdown, a lot of them are getting rid of seminar rooms and changing physical buildings in higher ed and again that will ripple down the home education market is I, I don't know the, the figures for today but that's rising as a lot of parents felt that actually mainstream school wasn't supporting their children in the same way so you know times are a changing yeah and they and they now know that there are the resources out there that you know if you are going to home educate you, you yeah. don't have to sit down and do it yourself. There's so much out there in terms of rich resources that that it is it is feasible for the right people in the right circumstances. You know. Yeah, I agree, and I think you know the work that I've done, and I think the work we saw in lockdown, where some of the more vulnerable children were pleased not to be in, in a physical building at school. You know, schools are not always great for teachers. They're not so great for a lot of students as well. And I know the social aspect is needed but in home education there's communities and, and and children that kind of do meet up and do things so it's start you know not only is it a question why would you want to work in a school is like why would a student want to go to school if they could essentially you know be tutored by maybe some of the best people in the world you know you can do that virtually that the resource is already there that they're not going to be bullied in the corridors. They're not going to feel uncomfortable. They can work at the times of the day that suit them best in their, in their development and their own milestones. You start to see, actually, that the state school education sector in particular needs to try harder. We need, you know, and that's hard when a lot of people feel that they're on their knees already. And that's where I do think that technology is that equaliser. Yeah. And if we're talking about continued conversations around learning it needs to be in that bespoke way um and I think the hard thing in education at the moment it has gone so binary in terms of you know exclusions for example the, the thoughts and feelings around that attendance in particular um so there's the consistency is very hard in the state school sector we we know from kind of lockdown but it's kind of working out what our values and what we want our roadmap and where we want our schools and trust to sit in that. What is our offer now? Um, mm. and, and how does that help productivity and learning? 
I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I think that's that's one of the difficulties. It comes back to what you were saying earlier, you know, about leaders making it clear that, you know, there is this this psychologically safe space to take risks. And you were talking to me about your um, um, your daredevils back in, you know, the mid-2000s. Mm. You know, and I'm still hearing today of schools who are having a let's take a risk week. Yeah. And it's it's seen as being, wow, that's a bit <laughs> out there. But but it's been happening for, and you know we, we all know education goes around in in cycles mm-hmm. um, with different names for things and, and different yeah. pro, or different ways of labeling them. But I think the issue we have in education is that you know come back to that point I made earlier about you know you're only as good as your last set of results. There's not yeah. the psychological safety for school mm-hmm. leaders to be able to say we can afford to say mm-hmm. we're going to focus on the long game. Mm-hmm. Because in the long term, that's going to benefit everybody because mm. they can't afford to take the foot off the pedal with the short game because mm. that's, you know, you you live and die by the sword, you know. Um, yeah. And that's that's systemic. You know, that's not anything that the leaders can do anything about. It's not anything that teachers, it's not anything that pupils can really do anything about, you know. And, and I do think it's a real shame that, you know, the yes, there needs to be accountability, but at the same time, there needs to be that that psychological safety that okay if you really believe in what you want to do there should be a mechanism whereby we say okay we're going to we're going to support you to try that because we don't know what the benefits might be but actually let's let's find out you know yeah and you know there are organizations so you take organizations like forum strategy for ceos there's institute school business leaders we work with both of them and they offer a really lovely kind of environment for those people in those positions to have conversations with like-minded people, find out new ideas, work out who's doing what. And I think that can help the system change by our leaders feeling more confident that they can do these things. You know, we are in a state school sector. We do have Ofsted. We do have kind of measurements that we're given. Some head teachers really, you know, take that to heart. Some head teachers feel more confident and kind of play the game a bit more. Um, But what I think kind of needs to happen is there's there's a lot of us still I heard something the other day about being on the dance floor and we're kind of in the dance floor when we're you know we're throwing all the shapes where well, I used to back in the day throwing all the shapes and then actually we're not going sitting on the balcony very much and that's what I'm trying to do that's you know and when you're a teacher you don't have time for that and that's right because that's the role but it's more in the school leaders where they should be sitting on the balcony they should be trying to work out where they want to be and listening to the voice of the staff that they've got about the best ways that they can do that and what those incremental steps are um, about what what does it feel like coming to, to an organisation. And, you know, when you hear about CEOs and head teachers work shadowing, not, you know, not sort of learning walks, but like work shadowing and really having kind of empathy and compassion for their staff to understand what it's like being on the site team for an hour, what it's like, you know, being a CEO, maybe in a different organisation. It's, it's those things that really give me hope that we're starting to really think about the people, because that's what we've got, the physical buildings, a lot of them are shot anyway. But, you know, it's about the people that every day are turning up and starting over again. And 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 like how amazing is that those communities each single day that they they turn up those kids turn up every day, ready to kind of do whatever or to, you know, or rebel against it or whatever it is. But that you know, and it's where are we going? And I, I think that's again, I, you know, bring it back to that technology. It's that technology which we rely more and more and more on. So we have to get with the program. We have to kind of understand it more um, and make time, make time to understand what it is because it will only help us, I think, going forward. Totally. And, you know, the, the old adage, isn't there, you know, why do kids come to school? Well, because they have to. Absolute mm-hmm. rubbish. But right? if, if it was because they have to, they'd find a way out of it. They come to school to have their needs met. Whatever though, and whether that's a social need, whether that's an emotional need, whether it's a learning need, doesn't really matter. That's why they come to school. And and if you're not providing that, that's when they vote with their feet and they stop coming and they find ways around it. Um, same with staff, with recruitment and retention. And I think I, I wrote a blog the other day, you know, just thinking about lesson observations over the years and things like that. And just, you know, just kind of musing in, in my own head, really. You know, what would it be like if instead of having a lesson observation where somebody comes and tells you, 
what was nice about your lesson and what you could do better if actually they said, right, we're going to plan a lesson together. We're going to deliver yeah. it together. We're going to reflect on it together. And I'm going to learn from you and you're going to learn from me. Yeah. And at the end of it, we've both had a really positive experience because we're in this together with the same pupils in the same school. And, and what That's a, it. a seed change that would be, you know. Yeah. And I, again, I remember like we looked at ideas like that where we would um, almost a bit like the kind of super nanny bit yeah. that, that yeah. we would mark, mark up a member of staff. We'd help plan a lesson with them and then they would do the lesson and then you'd be there kind of in their ear just to kind of help or just, you know, the bits that maybe if, you know, they were trying to focus on their use of voice or use of space or, you know, how they did communications with a child and needed more specialist help with that. So how could we kind of coach a member of staff through a lesson and then kind of go back on it and see how they were and then work out that support? Because I think with Ofsted, that's the issue that a lot of people have is they come and they do an inspection and there's no kind of aftercare. And that's, I think what, if we're thinking about curriculum staff in particular, that's kind of what they want that, you know, the training that you kind of get, unless you've got a great mentor in your school still, teaching is really lonely i i know yeah. how lonely it is and and you can go to work and you can you, you know you can do the small talk but you cannot you know there's so many emotions there's so much you process as a teacher day to day dealing with the students that you know that it is hard i think to have that reflection time and to kind of work out and I've always said that teaching is a kind of a combination of an art and a science. It's that it's, you know, you have to craft yourself as a teacher to understand it, but always be very, you know, that, you know, the biggest learner in the classroom. And I think we're starting to lose that. I think this kind of want of control because of things like radical misogyny, because of, you know, a feeling that, you know, young people are, with social media, it's sort of out of our control. We don't really understand there's this kind of clamp down in some areas of education but that doesn't really seem to be working it seems um and so we're gonna we're gonna end up with this mixed picture this kind of jigsaw of education with home learning a kind of a mixture of technologies and and and, and university change for that kind of social mobility if you if you take social mobility as any type of university um mm. and things kind of will change so i mean my hope is you know, after lockdown, it was like, well, what did we learn? And a lot of people came out saying, well, we've done our ed tech, that's it. Not kind of a learning we needed. And I think now we're starting to, maybe the dust is starting to settle after the trauma uh, uh, with the cost of living crisis. And now we know we haven't got the money, but we're starting to see, I don't want to say a system because a system is a, a series of things working together. I don't think we have an education system at the moment. I don't think it's working. So no. it's up to us how we may our small communities. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How we bring that unity of our communities, you know, for the next few weeks, but how are we gonna do it next year and how are we gonna do it for the next five years? And what is that vision for those year sixes that will be coming in in September? You know, what will their education look by at the end or you know for our, our early years or whatever kind of transition points we've got and I think those I think that's really important for school and 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 teachers to to start to reflect on you know what am I doing where's kind of my you know not five-year plan but five-year kind of goals um just as a way of just just bringing a bit more equity into it I think absolutely and, you know, at, at the end of the day you know, as teachers, we've been saying it for years. Well, you know, we're teaching them to do this this way because in five years time, they're going to have to do this or in 10 years time, they're going to do do that. We don't know that. No. You know, everything is moving so fast. We have no idea what what exams are going to be like in five years, what job applications and interviews are going to be like. You know, we, we have no actual concrete evidence no. to base that on because because it hasn't happened. No. Um, I think that like come back to that that point you made you know the the fact that that, that holding on i suppose to feeling like you need to be like the gatekeeper of all knowledge mm. in the classroom has to go and and yeah. we've got to adapt and and inevitably become more kind of coaches of um adaptive learners so that yeah. whatever they face they've got the skills to face it um and 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 that's what makes them the more rounded individual harder to quantify probably Mm. but but certainly much more much more relevant and much more useful long term yeah and it's yeah I mean I, I kind of think you know with the, the 
the first kind of generations of teachers that have taught through this kind of digital revolution like we're it's okay to not really know where it's going because no no we've got no blueprint for what we're meant to be doing at the moment and I think the more people that kind of realize that and and, and become either at ease or leave a profession because that's not what they want find something else I think kind of the better which sounds pretty ruthless but it's holding us back it's holding the kids back um we haven't known when you look at a lot of the future of work things we haven't known about the jobs and, and I've, I've done quite I used to do quite a lot of like links to industry I worked I worked with Vodafone back in what, about 2008 because they wanted to um have more teenagers using mobile phones would you believe Can you remember the happy slapping yeah so, yeah yeah so they wanted more teenagers to use mobile phones which makes me just feel like I should be on a scrappy now saying that but it's you know, we need to kind of understand we're not going to know what the jobs are. And in education, a lot of people are very institutionalized. They mm. haven't had many jobs out there. Um, and so because they don't know, they can't prepare. We've got um, incredible links with the GEC. We've got National Careers Week. Um, they've got loads online with them. And then we've got ERIC, which focus on like the creative arts. Um, we've the organisations like BBC Sport, with BFI sponsor it. And it's, you know, a free app for young people. It's amazing. Um, where they can get information about careers and actual, you know, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And there's there's kind of more of a movement out there to help education understand what those careers are. Because actually, as teachers, we don't understand the jobs out there. We don't have time to look at what all the jobs are. We're too busy trying to do the curriculums. And I think that's the the last point on this is actually when you train to be a teacher, you quite often do it because of your love of the subject and the love of young people. And actually, where we're sort of saying you might not need to be a content provider, you might need to be more facilitator. That's a very different skill set or outcome for what a lot of modern teachers go in for. Mm. So there is that kind of what does that model then look like? Where is that appreciation that I've always thought? Imagine you get the best people. There's a masterclasses. I don't know if you've seen it and it's got like, I don't know, you know, like, Jodie Foster teaching direction and Neil Gaiman teaching storytelling all that kind of you know imagine that that's your choice it's the comp down the road or it's those people teaching your children who actually don't need qualifications in the same way with digital careers they need a portfolio you know we're kind of looking at a different space of what the outcomes of education are because if they're not qualifications and it's not social interaction what are we providing in our schools and I think that's the kind of that's that's where we're going. That's where we're going. Yeah. I mean, you take it back to its fundamentals, you know, initially what were teachers for? It was to, it was to get the knowledge to people because it would take them too long to to, to digest it all themselves from going to libraries, reading books and everything else. Mm. But actually, it's completely flipped and they can get the information much quicker than we can give it to them. Absolutely. It's teaching them what to do with that information, whether to trust it how yeah. to cross-reference it, and all of those really important, not just digital skills, but critical th thinking skills that are going to make them successful in the future. And I think, you know, that that's definitely the way we need to be looking. Definitely. And, you know, the kids, they can look things up. We can all look things up. So right. actually, we're, so then education becomes more about child development. And actually, what do we need to teach them to help their brain as, as a mature adult? So that's a, that's a whole different question. And you know, schools came in in this country were essentially sort of based on the grammar school system. And it was a way of people being able to work going through the kind of industrial revolution because it gave the children somewhere to be. And as you start to go through it, you see the levels of safety kind of start to go up. I mean, you know, still have issues around safety now in schools. We haven't got it right. And I think, you know, where education came in sort of 100 years ago. And again, you can go and Google it. I don't have to tell you about it. Um you can find out that actually where society is is slightly different we do need something so people can go and have a job you know it doesn't suit everyone to have their kids at home you know my three are at school I'm doing this that suits me um but it's how how we get that balance and what those steps are. it's not going to happen overnight so it's working out what's best for our our teachers and for our students now but with a view and that's where bet is good and it might seem like blue sky but you know, we're starting to see the ideas from 20 years ago, you know, they're in. And also the ideas we didn't know were out there 
um, are kind of being provided as well. So, yeah, I think um, the next 100 years of education is going to look very different to it does now, particularly when a lot of us know the system's not working as well as, as we would, you know, want it to. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, and when you when you put it like that as well, you know, what's 100 years in the history of, of humankind? Mm. Actually, we've got no idea what really works. No. We've got such a small, minuscule kind of case mm. study that we can't just say, well, that's the way we're going to do it then. Because, mm. you know, if, if you would if you put that forward in any other study anywhere, people would just rubbish it and say, well, that's not enough data. Forget about it. You know. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's OK to learn and change. So there's a yeah. lot around recognition. doesn't work for all kids. You know, not all kids have the same sort of cognitive milestones as everyone else. And and actually, you know, it's starting to come out that a lot of the research there's like a slice taking it and it's done in, in, in the wrong way. And, you know, we are allowed to make mistakes in education we are allowed to have fads and trends and you know all that kind of thing like any other sector does but I think there there needs to be a review at the moment particularly around again that kind of that sense of belonging in schools for staff and students alike where there there isn't money there's a lot of strain um the social issues that we've got at the moments for the students you know as well as for the staff as well the cost of living crisis hit all of us you know, against a backdrop of technology and, you know, sustainability, it, you know, it's a lot, there's a lot on us. So the more we can do to acknowledge and respect the teachers that are doing an incredible job out there, the more what we can do to make sure the voices of everyone else who's, you know, makes a school run, because it's not just the teachers that make a school run, you know, all everyone around it is, you know, is crucial because everyone, you know, needs a bit of a hug and a, a tap on the back and, you know, needs those pom poms in their face at the moment. So, you know, that I think the more, but I think the solutions won't necessarily come from a political point of view. I think we're going to start seeing a change that it is more like the stuff I'm doing, like from within the sector, um, yeah. who kind of understand, you know, the crisis we're in and want to do something to kind of support it. Absolutely. Then, you know, that rounds things off nicely. And, uh, you know, I cannot emphasize enough the you know the the value of being involved in those different communities or collectives or uh, of really reaching out and, and finding like-minded people that are prepared to be open and honest but also challenge you in the right ways mm. uh, really support you and move you forward and um if if people watching and listening are are interested in checking out um the GEC obviously you very I'll put the links in in the oh. description and everything else but it's the gec.education um, very um, simple kind of four steps to get started in terms of uh, a self-assessment of the school and the staff. You get your results, you know, they're all prepared for you. You get support with putting together an action plan and then you've got that wealth of, of uh, resources available and that whole collective available to support you, um, which I think is, is absolutely superb. So thanks to you, Nick, for, for joining me and, uh, and for sharing your thoughts and for sharing your expertise with with the wider world as well because oh. i think we need to do more and more of that best of luck with the with the nomination for bet as well um, thank you, sure thank you. Bet, we'll do it. Um, and if you are watching and you can manage to get yourselves down to bet um at the end of march really do do so if you book your ticket before the third of march it's completely free as well it's a great opportunity to see uh see things in actions but also to hear from people who are, who are really kind of moving and shaking the way things we're doing things in education. Um, so thanks, Nick, for joining us. Thanks to everyone for, for watching or listening. Uh, and we'll see you again uh, soon. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks.